Hello, I'm Jishan Karbanda. And I'm Ron Batu. And welcome to our podcast, Weekly Dose of High School, where we'll be guiding you through the life of a high school student while speaking to knowledgeable people in the industry. Welcome to our fifth episode. Today, we are here with Dinas Kane, a field director at the Rishi Kumar for Congress Internship. I have personally known Dinas for over a half a year now, and that is through this internship. And I can tell you that, that she's extremely hardworking and passionate when it comes to working in this internship and basically anything she does. And now, folks, in today's episode, we're going to be hearing Dinas speak about current events and her experiences throughout life. Before we get started, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience, Dilnaz? Yeah, thanks, Vern. So my name is actually Dilnaz Tadiwala Kane. It's a mouthful, but I do go by Dilnaz Kane to keep it easy uh, at, at the internship. I'm a resident of Campbell, California. I came to the United States as a young student in the 90s. I was actually living in Mississippi, believe it or not. That's where I got started and then moved to the Bay Area in 2000, just before the dot-com bust uh, to start my internship at Sun Microsystems, probably a company that most of your audience has not even heard of anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's just really my background. Um, I, I did the engineering thing, then I did an MBA, then I decided to take a break. And now I'm enjoying my time abundantly with the Rishi Kumar campaign. And Oracle bought Sun, right? Like some Correct. Kind of, um... Yes, you're right. It did. But I'd left by that point. Okay. Thanks for sharing your background, Dilnas. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode. So the first question I have for you is, in the recent news, you may, or audience may have not heard of this, it's basically like a group of Saratoga high school students that got stranded in Europe when they went for like a band concert or something because of Lufthansa's flight cancellations. And so could you explain more about this and how Rishi Kumar, the congressional candidate, has helped out with this situation? Yes, actually, I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, um, one of Rishi's taglines is like, I'm, I'm a doer, I get things done. And I actually got to see this in play and happen um, immediately. I believe he was contacted on July 22nd. Hey, Rishi, can you help us? We've got the Saratoga students stranded in Prague. And it was like 120 students uh, and their chaperones that were stranded. Lufthansa canceled the flights and basically turned around and said, well, sorry, you can probably go back home in September. And here are these kids and chaperones and they're like, well, school starts, the parents were getting freaked out. And, you know, one of the good things about Rishi is that he really, he's kind of a call to action kind of person. He really does not procrastinate. He's always on the move. And so I got a letter and an email in my mailbox in his newsletter. He started emailing everybody in his newsletter with links. Hey, could you please tweet this out? And can you please send these emails to the German chancellor, the ambassador, the Lufthansa CEO? And, you know, it took him hours to go find these people's email addresses. It's not a joke. Like, you can't find a CEO's email address on a, on, on a whim. You can't do that. So he put the time and energy in, and he had links. And all I did was go ahead and tweet it. And there was emails that you could send to all these people. And it was not just in English. There was a German translation as well that you could use. So he did that. And I believe within a couple of days, he also managed to find someone who was able to contact people in Germany to connect with the German CEO of Lufthansa, or pretty C-suite people in Lufthansa. And eventually they chartered flights and got the kids here. They got NBC involved. You can go find, a lot of this is actually available. ABC was involved. And with enough noise and enough visibility, those kids were back home on the 25th. And mm -hmm. they chartered flights and Lufthansa dealt with it. Um, and I'm sure you've heard that there's strikes going on. Those kids could have been stranded even longer. So it's really great to have somebody like Rishi on your side. And it just so happened it happened to be his city. So I, I think the Saratoga kids should be very grateful that they had a city council member that was available, that was willing to go above and beyond while in the middle of his congressional campaign to help them out. That's crazy. Oh, I didn't even one, know. And one last thing. This is one thing about the Rishi that's made him very 
relatively popular in, in Saratoga, his ability to do community engagement. So this is where it really helped out, where everybody was willing to go ahead and put the noise out, put that message out that these kids are stranded and we need help. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't even know about that. Like, mm -hmm. it's crazy they can just strand, like, leave some people hanging all the way for like months, even minors. So, mm -hmm. well done, Rishi's part. And now I'm gonna ask you, Dilas. So, you know, Rishi Kumar is a very tech savvy candidate. He worked in the big tech, and so he's like the first candidate in Congress's history to have this tech savvy background. So for our audience who may be unaware of this, how important is, do you think, that having leaders in our Congress and our government who are acquainted with technology, how important do you think this is? Actually, it's, it's not, not only is it important now, it's going to be very important in the future. Like the urgency right now is, is extremely critical that people that understand technology, its impacts, its potential impacts in the future, um, are are going to become regulators or leaders of the future. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say I started college somewhere in my in the early '90s. The internet, as you know it, was very different back mm -hmm. then, and um, the word cyberbullying laws didn't even exist at that point. Okay. So this is something in technology, the person developing a technology will be solving a problem for today. He might create a product that solves a problem one way today, but we have no idea how it gets used. That technology gets used in the future. And just when I started working, when I was working 20 years ago, I would hear this all the time. Our laws are not able to keep up with the technology. I would hear it all the time, okay? The technology would expand, it would get like I said, people don't know how their products, like Facebook started out in a college dorm to meet girls, right, to get addresses. Look what Facebook has done now. Look where it's at. Look the impact it's had around the world. Look how the impact it even has on politics. Look the impact it has on bringing people together in terms of when seniors get lost, people just post, my grandfather is lost, and people find them and bring them back. I kid you not. It's happened, right? That's mm -hmm. not what Mark Zuckerberg was thinking. I'm going to help find someone's grandparent on the street that's lost, right? So the laws have to change and adapt. But if the people making those laws are trying to comprehend the impact that technology is having on society or their constituents don't get it, how are they going to pass any law or regulate? So it's extremely critical. Like I said, cyberbullying was not even a thing. Like nobody understood that could be a thing that laws would have to get passed for that. We had enough kids getting hurt that finally laws got passed. And just recently, I would say a few years ago, um, internet of things, That's that was the key word, again and again, again and again. And nobody understood how that could be hacked. Nobody understood how that could be weaponized. So California was the first state to pass cybersecurity laws for the internet of things. Nobody would have seen that coming, but California adapted. So it is really critical that the people who are legislating understand how the technology can be used. And there are people there. Obama was the first one who used social media to engage with the people. Mm -hmm. And he got really popular really fast and we felt connected to him and he was lovable. AOC is another good example of how she tweet storms. So the ones who know will, will do better, will, you know, look successful. And um, not to play devil's advocate, but how do you think that um, turned out for Trump. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Isn't it funny? Well, depends on the guys listening to Trump, the guys who are listening to him, maybe, uh, or enjoying it until they couldn't listen to him. I, I don't know. That's a good question. It's kind of funny um, that you asked that question. But um, yeah, I, I'm just going to leave it as that. It's actually <laughs> yeah. a really funny question. <laughs> right. It's a, actually a really funny question. Um, <laughs> depends on who you ask. Some guys are going to say that was completely not cool. And some guys are going to say that was the best thing that ever happened. So <laughs> you, you pick which which devil's advocate you want to play. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Dilmas. Mm -hmm. Well, Dilmas, a few days ago, Jishan was talking about how you studied and worked in the hardware engineering field. So how was it overall and how do you think it's different from software engineering? Okay, so yeah, that's, um, that's like the, the uh, that's a great question. So um, yes, my degree is in computer engineering, both the undergrad and the masters. 
And um, I did start out relatively on the hardware engineering side. I don't really have much experience developing software on the software engineering aspect. So theoretically, when you're a hardware engineer, you're supposed to be designing microprocessors and chips and motherboards and you know laying out motherboards, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really what your training is supposed to be. What you'll find in reality is a lot, hardware engineering, there's very limited jobs out there. It's very specialized you, and, you know, and uh, it can become an exclusive club after a while. But what happens in reality is that a lot of hardware engineers will eventually transition into software engineering roles. You know, it just happens. You're going to learn programming regardless of the fact of what, what uh, engineering degree you're getting, if it's computer engineering or software engineering. So you're going to learn uh, how to write code. And you'll find um, that, and there's more of an overlap on the hardware guys having to write code um, that they will, most of them will transition into software engineering roles. So I did start out as a hardware engineer. Um, by the end of it, I was still on the hardware side in quality assurance. Um, and I didn't do as much software engineering or programming as uh, if, if I had been a software engineer. And so that's been my experience. That doesn't mean that most people who get computer engineering degrees, like I said, stick to hardware engineering. They do transition into software engineering. I personally enjoyed my time at Sun Microsystems. I also enjoyed my time at NVIDIA. Um, and if I had to do it over again, I would probably still stick with hardware engineering. Uh, it's just a bias. It's just a preference. Um, and, um, so, and my husband's a software engineer. And the reason I say uh, it's a bias and a preference because software engineering has become so complex and so vast that just dealing with that much ambiguity sometimes would stress me out as a hardware engineer. So like I said, I would stick to hardware engineering if I had to do it over again. Thank you, Donas. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Donas, um, now I know you might not be like fully experienced with the college admission process here. But, like how important is it? Like do you think high schoolers engage in like certain activities such as this political internship to like boost their college applications? And why would that be? Yeah, honestly, I really, like you said, I really don't have that experience, but I did have to do college admissions to the United States because I was a little bit of an odd duck. I came from the United Arab Emirates. I was going to an American school, an American university. So just like what you would call a junior college. I also was in an American school there. I did my freshman and sophomore years there, and then I transferred. So I was an international transfer student as an undergraduate. Like I said, that wasn't very common, but some of us kids from the United Arab Emirates um, had that opportunity. And so I did have to do college admissions. I had to write the essays. I don't recall having to talk about any of my extracurricular activities. Um, I just answered whatever six essays they wanted me to write. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of legal work that needed to get done on the back back end with the US consulate and you know showing your financial resources, your parents, whatever. So there was so that was the more stressful part, I would say, for someone like me than doing the college applications. And so I I have no idea. Um, you know, I have no idea how critical it is, but based on what I've seen in the past 20 years of living in the United States and my friends' kids or my family's um, kids, I know that they all put them in extra volunteer organizations. And I hear one thing only, oh, it's for their college application. It's for their college applications. So I'm sorry, I actually really don't know <laughs> how critical it is, but I've seen people, my friend's kids go to Cornell, um, NYU, and I know that the parents have them in extra activities, you know, since they're 13, 14, 15, they're already doing extra stuff with the community and volunteering. Thank you. So, Bill Norris, you recently said you have some experience in the college admissions. So, I just want to ask like a specific question. So, is there something specific colleges want to see in an applicant besides having like an excellent GPA, good SAT score, or like several extracurricular activities? So, in general, you know, um, college acts as a weeding out process, believe it or not. Okay. 
And they're trying to see who's the best person or best fit um, for their, let's say, college, okay? And they're trying to see if you've shown that you can consistently commit to something, if you, you, you are a well-rounded person. So these are my guesses, okay? Um, and, um, you know, that, that you're sort of a go-getter. There, there's, there's, I personally don't know, but I remember that the questions they'd shown are like leadership skills or what ex excites you. That's that's all I can say. I personally don't have an idea about what they are looking for. I can go by what my MBA application looked like, and they really wanted to see if you're somebody who who has displayed entrepreneurial skills, who's displayed initiative, because they needed to figure out if you'd be a good fit for the college that you were joining. My MBA was in sustainability, so ideally I should have mentioned, hey, yeah, I do care about the environment. I care about recycling. I care about and and if people are missing that point in their essay, then maybe they're not a good fit for that that school. They might not align with the mission of the school. Thanks, Dilnas. Okay, Dilnas. So you know there are like courses, government related courses in high school nowadays. Like one good example is AP government and politics. And so like how important is it that like high schoolers are educated and have taken these courses so they're up to date with like our current day society. Yeah, so I actually really like this question. And, and the reason I really like it is because um, I've been somebody that never had the chance to vote till I was 34 years old, believe it or not, or even later. I don't know. So 38 probably was the first time I had the opportunity to vote in my life. And, and Honestly, if kids these days, if you guys are going to be our future, are disconnected and don't have an idea what regulations are being passed or what your leaders are doing, you will just be a bystander and a spectator. And I promise you, you don't want that. You don't want that. You guys have so much information easily available to you now that you can make decisions. You can move the puck, you guys, you know, just get on groups and quickly make the right choices and noise that's needed. So I think understanding how your government works is extremely critical so that you guys can help shape it. Um, let's see, I, I'm trying to give you guys an example of, of if you're not engaged, Let's just look at SB 10, SB 9, controversial subject. If uh, Jishan has mentioned this, Rishi Kumar was actually fighting against um, that bill. That's the one where they want to put um, a four unit apartment in residential neighborhoods to create more, um, more housing, okay? Mm -hmm. So they want to pack a four unit apartment complex into a residential neighborhood. Most residential neighborhoods are already having problems with parking. Um, most residential neighborhoods don't want that kind of noise. It would be crazy. Did they care to ask us? Maybe. We're allowed to give public comments. Did they care what we said? No. But if we would have known something like this was coming sooner, we probably would have fought it harder. So there's many choices that met made for us. And if you're not staying on top of it, and if you're not paying attention early in the game, then like I said, you will just be a spectator and you will just have to, you'll just be an observer. And it, it won't be fun. It won't be pleasant. It just won't be. So I think it's important that you get that sense of control. Even if it doesn't work, you got to put your comments in, you got to put your opinion in, you got to say, I disagree with what's going on here for this and this and this reason. And at least you tried. So I think it's very important that the kids these days understand um, how our government works and how it can impact. One, one part of society will say, this is a great idea. The other part will be like, this is terrible. It impacts me negatively. You have to learn to balance and 
you have to figure out, hey, wh what's the best way of making these decisions? Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. So, Dilnaz, I guess yesterday I was reviewing your LinkedIn profile, and it says you've studied STEM outside of the U.S. So, from your experience outside of the U.S. and here, how is it any different from the courses there and here? Okay. All right. So that's actually a good question as well. Okay. So I would say the first 12 years of my life, I was in the Indian system. So I went to a private school in UAE. It was called Abu Dhabi Indian School. And we used the Indian Central Board syllabus. And back then, things have changed now. Back then, it was more memorization based. Okay. Like all our schooling required us to just memorize things and regurgitate them on a piece of paper. We had finals, so we would go year round, not semester based like you guys. And we would, um, we had a, like a midterm, what you call a midterm, but that would be like four months in. And then at the end of the year, uh, 12 months, there'd be a final. So you'd be studying the whole year's worth of coursework. But here's the catch. Our grades didn't count until you took the finals and the midterms. We didn't have assignments and tests in between that got added to our final grade. So all of us would only cram as the word is used and care to study what we were assigned for the whole year at the end of the year, okay? Not the most efficient, effective, but still you see Indians excelling. That's the system that was there. The biggest change I noticed, and I found the American system to be quite hard because you're constantly being tested, but the biggest change was the critical thinking skills. Like I said, we used to memorize. Over here, they would make sure you understood and comprehended the information and test you on that comprehension. That's how it was when I went to school in Mississippi. So it became a little bit harder. You couldn't cram at the end. One, you're, you had to keep performing throughout the semester. And two, now you had to comprehend the information and apply it using the skills they'd asked you to develop during the, the coursework. So um, other, other things I noticed that were different between um, the American system and the Indian system was that, and this is what I actually liked in the Indian system, like for example, in physics, we would have to derive the formulas. Um, they weren't handed to us. We could not use calculators. So deriving the formulas helped quite a bit, but in the American system, we could plug them into our calculators. So there was pros and cons, I would say, and I would say that I benefited out of both of those systems. Personally, um, if I had to do it all over again, I would say I would prefer the American system in terms of that it, it shows you how to apply critical thinking skills and how to apply the knowledge that you're using. Um, some of the stuff, I still have gaps in my comprehension because I was just trying to scam the system as a child. And I find that my husband, who's US trained, will have to sometimes re-explain certain fundamental concepts to me because I just didn't get them as a child, but I passed. So I, like I said, if I had to do it over again, I would prefer the American system. Thanks for your response. And I have another question. So how was the housing situation for you in college? Because I heard that housing is only available for your freshman and sophomore years. But once you enter into your, once you enter into your junior year, you're kicked out from your dorm and you're expected to afford your own shelter. So how was the situation for you if you experienced it, of course? Mm -hmm. So actually, this was a first when I read this question or heard about this, I was very shocked. I didn't even know that was a thing. And I spoke with my husband and he said, oh, yeah, he went to Santa Clara University. And he said, oh, yeah, it was the same when I went to college. Personally, that was not the way it was set up for me in Mississippi. We were we could stay in the dorms uh, as long as you were a full time student, you had access to the dorms. So even like through my master's program, I could stay in the dorms as long as I was registered as a full-time student. So I arrived as a junior, like I said, and I had you know dorm access. They had se separated where the freshmen would be, where the sophomores would be, but I, I lived in the dorms on campus the whole time. And eventually when my credits got a little bit low, because, you know, I'd taken a summer break, a class in the summer, I didn't have enough um, classes to, you know, be full-time. Um, I moved off campus with some other students and that was fine. And it was, it was a good transition um, at that point for me. But um, I find it a bit shocking to hear that you're expected to considering just in the Bay Area, there's such a housing shortage. So I don't understand 
how that makes any sense. I really just don't. Yeah, that truly sucks, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Okay, then that. So um, I know that we were talking about this earlier and like how it's good to be always engaged with the government. So like, how do you think that joining the internship at Rishi Kumar for Congress, how has that like changed your view overall about our current system of government and without like bashing any political party or political spectrum? Okay. Um, I would say the one thing that's changed and uh, one of your other fellows, Anna Kolpakova said this to me and she put, she put the words in my mouth, honestly. She said after the election 2016, she felt very helpless and wanted to know what to do. And now she feels like she can make an impact at the local level. So I personally feel the same way. Uh, Rishi's asked me to run for city council, just like how he got started in Campbell. And, and personally, I'm relatively happy in Campbell, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. So there's other uh, directors in our um, campaign as well who have now, who are running for city council in their cities. So they've also been inspired to try, and that was the same thing we said, that you know at least you can make a difference on, at least you can try making a difference. So I would have to echo Anna's thoughts that I felt very helpless I, and out of control and didn't know what to do. And Rishi Kumar's campaign gives me a more well-rounded perspective of some of the challenges um, that just like when I said SB 10, SB 9, the bills that Rishi was fighting, it wasn't just him, it was the mayor of San Jose. There were other people from other cities, council members fighting this bill that Sacramento was pushing down on the cities. So this whole time I thought everybody was kind of in on it. And I'm not bashing any party. I just thought everybody was in on it. But to see people at the local level fighting Sacramento, that's when it became obvious to me that no, it's not, it's not everybody. It's just a few bad apples causing some of this chaos. And so it gave me a little bit more hope and it gave me a little bit more of passion to try to fix things that maybe I'm not happy with instead of just complaining about them. Got it. Thank you, Dilnas. So Dilnas, this is my final question for you. So Jishan and I will be entering college next year and we'll be taking extremely hard courses in the following years. So do you have any, do you have any advice for us and our audience in ways we could relieve stress? Sure, actually I do. And this is advice I did not take from my mother. So make sure you follow this advice. <laughs> um, you will be stressed. College is not easy. It, it isn't. And that's a good thing because it's preparing you for life. You're going to learn to be alone. You're going to be in, in a new environment. Um, you're, you're going to be responsible for yourself. It's, it's not easy, but it's good. It's necessary transition to adulthood. Okay. Now, the advice my mother used to give me, and remember, I was in Mississippi, my mother was in the United Arab Emirates. She would tell me, Dilnaz, why don't you just paint or knit? Because that's what she used to see me being happy and relieving stress when I was younger. But I was so bogged down with all the classes and focused on making my grades and keeping my GPA up and worrying about this and worrying about that, that I sort of let it all slide and fly away from me. But I shouldn't have. I should have focused on the parts that helped me stay grounded, helped me stay focused, and not just focus on just, oh, I got to get this grade, I got to do this, I got to do that, because it can become, it can cause you to get burnt out. So fall back on things that give you joy, fall back on, hey, I'm, I haven't slept enough, I really should take a break now. Your brain will not work, so it's important that you take that time out so you can do better and understand what needs to be done better. So definitely always pay attention to how you're feeling, not saying slack off, and do just a little bit of the things that make you happy. I had friends that used to go play soccer once a week. They were soccer players when they were in high school. So they made it, made it a point to go play soccer, regardless of what was going on, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering guys, they would find the time to go do the things that help them relieve stress. Mm -hmm. I agree with you there. You only Thanks. need to experience it once. Thanks, Dilnaz. Jishan and I will definitely take your advice. 
Okay, Dimas. Now I have one final question for you before we wrap up today's episode. So I'm going to ask you now, this question is going to be a bit personal. So like when you're not canvassing or doing activities related to the Rishi Kumar for Congress internship, what are you doing and why and do you enjoy what you're doing? Is it like spending time with friends, walking your two beautiful dogs or what else? Yes. Okay. So yes, those were my primary activities uh, pre-COVID, but thanks to COVID, um, you know, uh, some of the friendships, I'm not saying they, 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 we don't spend as much time together because everybody just got bogged down because of being on Zoom calls and having to worry about their kids being on Zoom calls. And, and so everybody's just adapted to this new way of being. So I've had to adapt. So my first enjoyable thing is actually taking my dogs to the dog park because I found a new set of friends in the dog park during COVID because people were too scared to socialize indoors. So I landed up going to the dog park and landed up meeting a whole bunch of seniors who always show up there. They're 87, 80, 60 uh, from England, from Russia, Ukraine, all over the world. And um, that is one of my very gratifying and enjoyable activities in the morning to take my dogs there. And, um, and we're always talking politics and it's hilarious because nobody agrees with anybody and everybody's still friends. So it's, it's wonderful to be in that sort of a situation. Um, besides that, when I'm stressed, I bake, I bake a lot and thank God that I have neighbors that appreciate my baking. Um, when I'm not doing that, I do like going to the movies. I enjoy sci-fi movies all the time. I'm a big sci-fi movie junkie. And when I'm not doing that, I have not traveled since COVID and next week it will be the first time I get on a plane in two years. So I used to like to travel quite a bit to different unique countries. Um, Curacao, most people don't know where that is, but it was the most enjoyable trip. January 2020 was the last time. And then we went to Patagonia in Chile. So um, definitely, I like traveling quite a bit. Got it, Dilas. Thank you. Thank you, Dilas. Well, that's it for today for episode five of Weekly Dose of High School. Hope you guys enjoy listening to Bill Nas speak about her experiences in college. And also, guys, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our podcast, whether you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, or even YouTube. We're on all those platforms, and we upload weekly episodes, so make sure you guys subscribe so you never miss an upload. Until then, take it easy, guys. Mm-hmm.